we're back after a two-week break. I hope you enjoyed last weekend with no UFC. I hope you made the most of it because we now start the insanely busy summer schedule where we've got 13 consecutive weeks of UFC, starting with this weekend with a card headlined by Amir Albazi and Kai Kara France. So as ever, in this video, we're going to be breaking down all of the main card fights from a betting perspective. We're going to be taking a deep dive into each of these fights and hopefully the information in this video is going to help you make better betting decisions, maybe even earn some extra cash. And don't forget, if you'd like to take part in my live betting group this weekend, we've got spaces available. You can see the profitability chart here in the background. And, you know, if you're not really that excited about events, like Albazi versus Kai Car friends this weekend, if we're being brutally honest. It's not the most interesting card. A way to make it more interesting is to come into my live betting group because the low key fight night cards tend to be, you know, pretty profitable for us. They tend to be our cash cows. We tend to perform pretty well on cards like this and it'll make watching the fights way more interesting. So come to my website, give it a try. If you want to sign up, just need to go to the home page, scroll down where it says in play membership you can learn more there if it sounds interesting you can sign up if you don't like it no problem send me an email we'll get you refunded no problem but i think you will like it because not only will it make watching the ufc events a lot more entertaining because you'll you know you'll be able to earn money from watching them but on top of that um yeah you'll also be part of a community that is you know taking a deep dive and analyzing the matchups as they're happening to you know dig up decent live bets which you know produce a profit most weeks for us if you look at the uh results you can see that you know we've barely ever had a losing quarter we make a profit most weeks so give it a try i think you'll be disappointed so we kick things off this week by breaking down the main event between amir albazi and kai Kara france a fight that is in the even money odds range and a good matchup, an interesting main event between two pretty well matched guys that have a few advantages over one another and that should make for an interesting fight. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds we can see that they're both in the even money odds range. So if you shop around you can bet both guys at odds of about 1.91 which is minus 110 for an implied probability of 52% and we can see that Albazi is competing in his first ever UFC main event so first time he's been in a five rounder he's 29 years old five foot five with a 68 inch reach and Kai Kara France is 30 years old five foot four with a 66 and a half inch reach so you can see Albazi is a little bit bigger nothing major no real differences in size either no real x factors to talk about on this one other than the fact that Albazi you know he, uh, he is competing in his first five rounder, so may start a little bit slower in order to pace himself over five rounds. Although his gas tank is usually pretty good, so it's not like I have any concerns for him in this matchup. So this one is an interesting fight because Albazi, I feel, is kind of being fast-tracked into the title picture. I don't think it's any coincidence that you know the flyweight title is going to be on the line this summer. And now Albazi and Cara France headline in this card. You'd think that the winner of this fight would take a big step towards a title shot. Maybe even become the number one contender. Which for Kai Cara France I guess makes a lot of sense. He's been around forever. He's had a lot of fights. You know, generally speaking, you know, he's been some top, beating some top, guy, top guys. You know, wins over Askarov. Uh, he was beating Brandon Moreno as well before getting stopped in strange circumstances but with Albazi I do question if it is perhaps a little bit too much too soon hasn't really beaten any top guys he does have four wins in the UFC but three of them against are against particularly low level opponents I mean Zuma Gulov is tricky but obviously Malcolm Gordon Francisco Figueiredo and Alessandro Costa very very low level guys so I guess another x factor for us to think about with this matchup this weekend is that Amir Albazi is uh, he's taking a big step up in competition. He's pretty good, you know. It doesn't appear to be you know any major weaknesses in his skill set. But Kai Kara France is a uh, completely different challenge to anything that Albazi's faced up until this point in his career. So when you look at the styles of both guys, 
Kaikar France is definitely a striker. There's no doubt about that. He's going to want to keep the fight standing. He's going to want to keep, you know, treat the ground like lava. We know that. You know, Car France trains at City Kickboxing. Striking is their thing. Amir Albazi. I wouldn't necessarily say he's a grappler. You know, he's a very well-rounded fighter. He can mix it up. He's reasonably good everywhere. He does a little bit of everything. But I do think Albazi's path to victory in this matchup is going to be on the ground. And if the fight stays standing, I certainly give Cara France the edge. So in this breakdown, when we're looking at this fight from a betting point of view, for me, the biggest question I'm trying to answer is, is Cara France going to be able to keep this fight standing? And if he does, what happens then? So if we talk about striking first of all and how they match up, they do have very different styles. So Albazi is a guy that is a lot more flat-footed than Cara France. He's much more orthodox in his in his style, and he likes to kind of plod forward and chip away at his opponents. Now I'd say he has a lot more power than Cara France, but he doesn't throw with the anywhere near the same volume as Cara France, and he also doesn't throw with you know. He also doesn't throw anywhere near the diversity of strikes that Cara France does. Cara France mixes things up. He'll throw spinning attacks, every kick you can think of. You know, beautiful boxing combinations. Whereas Albazi, much more of a single shot striker that loads up on one singular strike. So I do think Albazi is likely to have uh, a tough task on his hands keeping up with Cara France on the feet simply because I don't feel he has the volume or the technique to match Cara France and I just think Cara France is going to be able to dance around him with his superior footwork and just chip away at him with a much higher volume of strikes and much more diverse range of strikes. Now Albaz he showed in his last fight against Costa that he does have major power and we know Cara France loves to get you know dragged into big exchanges and while he is tough and he does have a good chin we also have seen him dinged a few times in the UFC, dropped, wobbled, um, and so he's certainly not bulletproof. So while Bazzi does have the power to hurt him, but in terms of technique and volume, this fight is a fight where, you know, in my opinion, Cara France has a clear edge on the feet. Now, when it comes to grappling, there's no doubt that Al Bazzi has the advantage on the ground. One of Cara France's, or the biggest weakness in Cara France's skill set over the years, has been his ground game. Now, Cara France is one of these guys that is quite difficult to take down. He's got good balance. He's very athletic. He's good at reading takedown entries. And his takedown offense, like a lot of guys at City Kickboxing, is reasonably good. But Cara France is one of these grapplers that if you do get him down and you do obtain a dominant position on him, which isn't easy because he's very scrambly, but if you do obtain a dominant position on him, he's quite easy to control. So if you get on top of him, he's quite easy to hold down. If you get his back, you know, he's quite easy to control from back control. But because Cara France's initial takedown defense is pretty good, he's pretty scrambly, um, his defensive wrestling is pretty good, his balance is pretty good, you do tend to have to use... You know, a bit of persistent chain wrestling in order to get Cara France down and, you know, obtain dominant positions on him. We haven't really seen that from Amir Albazi. On top of that, Albazi's grappling control doesn't look amazing. It doesn't look terrible either, but he doesn't have the kind of crushing grappling control that you might need to keep a hold of as someone as scrambly as Cara France for long enough to obtain a dominant position on them. And so, if we really want to simplify our our analysis of a matchup such as this, one way in which you can do it is, after research, kind of accept that Cara France has got the edge on the feet. I would really question anyone that would give Albazi the advantage when it comes to striking. That would certainly be a very questionable opinion based on past performances doesn't mean Albazi can't show up and look a lot better than before doesn't mean that Cara France can't you know get caught with a big shot or have an off night but certainly based on past performances Cara France got a big edge when it comes to striking so where we don't know a whole lot about Albazi's grappling but we know he's competent on the ground the way that I'm looking at this is Askar Askarov is a pretty good offensive wrestler and we also know he's got good grappling control 
And now he did take Cara France down a couple times in that fight and obtain dominant positions. But for the most part, Askarov had a lot of trouble um, controlling Cara France past round one. And a big part of that is the fact that Askarov did slow as the fight wore on. And that won't necessarily happen to Albazi because he hasn't slowed in any of his past fights. But what I also noticed about that matchup is as soon as Cara France got a read on Askarov in terms of his, you know, his timing on his takedown entries um, and kind of got a feel for him in those grappling positions, Cara France neutralized absolutely everything that Askarov threw at him when it came to grappling. And so the way I would look at this from a really simplif simplified point of view is Kai Cara France has kind of proven that he's capable of neutralizing a pretty good MMA grappler in Askar Askarov. For the most part, Amir Albazi is very unproven. You know, three of the, the four guys he's beaten in the UFC are very low level. We haven't seen a whole lot of, you know, really high level grappling from him. So while I don't really have a strong opinion on this fight, I don't really have a strong lean either way. Um, the way that I am kind of leaning on this one is just in a situation where I don't feel that confident either way I'm trying not to overcomplicate things and I'm looking at it and I'm going both guys are in the even money yards range you know you bet either of them you get the same return right so out of the two gun to my head who do I think is the stronger position who do I think is more likely to win and I would look at it and I would go well Cara France almost certainly has the advantage on uh, you know when it comes to striking for me that's not debatable and so the question then remains can Albazi cause him you know problems with his grappling we don't really have the answer to that due to a lack of footage you know with, with Albazi facing guys with defensive wrestling as good as Cara France but the way I would look at it is if Cara France completely neutralized the offensive wrestling the MMA grappling of someone like Askar Askarov, who's one of the best MMA grapplers in the flyweight division, and he probably stands a pretty good chance of neutralizing, you know, the offensive wrestling, the MMA grappling of someone like Amir Albazi, particularly because Albazi is very inexperienced, and this is a huge step up in competition for him. It's his first main event, so through process of elimination, I would lean Cara France in this one, not with any amount of confidence, and I'm not going to be betting Cara France, but for me, where you could bet both guys in the even money odds range Cara France is kind of battle tested for me and there's a lot less questions hanging over him and you know exactly what you're getting with him you know he can go hard for five rounds you know he's tough you know he's scrappy you know he's durable you know he's well-rounded um you know he can handle himself wherever the fight goes and so yeah Albazi may have a bit of an advantage on the ground but if he can't use that he's probably in a lot of trouble here and there's a decent chance Cara France neutralizes Albazi's offensive wrestling because he did it to Askarov so I think Cara France is the smarter the better side to be on uh, this weekend but let me know what you think let me know what you think in in our new discord and uh, yeah let me know what you think in the comments below if you're watching on on the YouTubes so in terms of the over under on this one Obviously, a lot of flyweight fights tend to go to a decision just simply because uh, the lighter weight classes are just more likely to go to a decision. Um, where are we? So if we look at the over-under, we don't even have over-under odds. We've got fight go to a decision, fight not go to a decision. We'll settle for that. So fight goes to a decision, 2.30. Um I mean, I do think it's more likely the fight goes to a decision, I guess. I just don't have a strong feeling on this. It's, it, I don't really have an opinion on it. I just don't know because we don't really know what Albazi's gas tank is going to be like in a five-rounder. Um, you know, both guys, you know, are dangerous on the feet. Albazi showed he's got power in his last fight against Costa. Cara France aggressive, loves to get into exchanges. I mean, 25 minutes is a long time, right? 25 minutes is a long time for, for no one to get finished. Um, but fight not to go to decisions is too steep for me. If I were to bet this, uh, I'm not going to, but if I were to bet this, I do think fight goes to a decision at slight dog odds gives you the better risk to reward ratio. Now, in terms of the props on this one, um, 
it doesn't look like they're uploaded on best fight odds. So that's not very good. Doesn't look like the odds are working. So on that note, can't really talk about props. That ain't great. Um, oh well. Unfortunate. Is it like that for all the other fights? It is indeed. We might have to give prop bets a miss on this card. Because they aren't uploaded yet. Which is fucking terrible considering it's Wednesday and the fights are Saturday. So yeah, the odds aren't out for the majority of props. So we'll do over-unders. But for now, can't do props. Which is pretty annoying. Very, very annoying actually. Alright. Let's get it going. Let's go, let's go. So, next fight. So now let's break down the fight between Alex Caceres and Daniel Pineda. A strange matchup this. I don't mind it, but it's just a very, very strange fight. So we can see that Caceres is the favourite at average odds of around 1.57, which is going to be minus 175 for an implied probability of 64%. If we take a look at the odds on Pineda, he's around an average of 2.40 which is going to be plus 140 for an implied probability of 42%. So Caceres is 34 years old, 5 foot 10 with a 73 and a half inch reach. And Pineda, 37 years old, 5 foot 7 with a 70 inch reach. As you can see, both guys pretty old for featherweights. But Pineda, significantly older. He's going to be 38 years old in August, which is absolutely ancient for a featherweight. Caceres is 5 foot 10 with a 73 and a half inch reach. So that also means he's a little bit longer and taller than Pineda. And we know that Caceres has got that body type where he's long and lean. And he's got great footwork, great movement. And he knows how to use his length. So for me, this is a really interesting fight. And a clash of styles where I think this fight is going to be very one-sided. Uh, but I have no idea which way is going to be very one-sided because this is one of those matchups where both guys have extreme advantages in the area that the other is weak so Daniel Pineda now almost 38 years old when you watch him you can see that his reflexes are just totally shot father time has hit him pretty hard and as a result he's just not as sharp um, not as quick at reacting to his opponents as he used to be so a telltale sign that an older fighter's reflexes are starting to go is when they start to react to shots landing after they've landed and you definitely see this from Pineda you know in his recent fights against Tucker Lutz, Cub Swanson and Andre Philly in particular and so Caceres is one of these guys that has got great footwork, great movement so it's a really diverse range of attacks, a very high volume of strikes. And we also know he's tough and he's got a good chin as well. So Pineda has got a shorter reach. He's a lot slower. He's a lot older. He's a lot more flat footed. Can't match the volume of Caceres. And I think if this fight stays standing, Caceres is going to dance around Pineda all night. Rack up a huge volume of strikes and absolutely dominate this matchup. I just don't see it being competitive at all. I think Caceres is going to run away with it. I think it'll be an easy night's work for Caceres if he stays standing. But we know that Caceres' biggest weakness throughout his career has been his takedown offence and ground game. I mean, we all saw how bad Crone Gracie looked, uh, you know, recently against Charles Jordan. And Gracie made easy work of Alex Caceres. Literally took him down and strangled him in two minutes. I know it was a long time ago, but with Caceres getting older... You know, it's unlikely he's going to be making big improvements with you know takedown offense and ground game at this stage in his career. His takedown offense isn't as bad as he used to be, um, and on paper I think he is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. But his submission defense, his ground game, is still very very bad. And if Pineda gets gets this fight to the ground, he's going to cause him big big problems. I mean, we saw what Pineda did on the ground to Tucker Letts, um, and also to Herbert Burns. Both guys are better on the ground in my opinion than Alex Caceres so if Pineda gets his fight to the ground Caceres is going to be in a lot of trouble so the question remains or the question like this fight from a betting perspective kind of hinges on 
what is the probability that Pineda is going to be able to get this fight to the ground? That's really what we need to consider because we know if it stays standing, Caceres is going to win very easily. And why have I gone blurry? Let's fix that. Sorry, guys. There we go. We know if the fight stays standing, Caceres is going to absolutely dominate. We know if the fight goes to the ground, Pineda is going to dominate. So what's the likelihood Pineda is going to be able to get this fight to the ground? That's not an easy question to answer because at this stage in Pineda's career, he's old, he's stiff, his offensive wrestling is not the best. But when he gets you down, his grappling control is very good, his ground and pound is very good, his submission game is very good. Caceres is one of these fighters that has really good initial takedown defense. He's similar to Cara France in many ways in that because he's a lifelong striker, he's very good at reading takedown entries, seeing them coming early and dealing with them. So it's not easy to get Caceres down because his footwork and movement is, is so good. He's so good at reading you. He's very good at shutting down that initial takedown attempt. But Caceres is one of these guys that if you grab a hold of him, if you chain wrestle a bit, if you persist with the takedown, you can get him down quite easily and dominate him on the ground. Now, typically, that's not Pineda's approach to MMA grappling. Usually, Pineda shoots more individual single leg takedowns or double leg takedowns and if you stuff those then he kind of abandons them you don't usually see a whole lot of chain wrestling from Pineda however that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to see chain wrestling from him in this fight and he is pretty good at getting in deep on the legs and hips of his opponents you know he, he showed that in his last fight against Tucker Letts Tucker Letts I do think has better takedown offense than Alex Caceres his footwork and movement's not as good is Caceres, so Takalet is a little easier to tie up than Caceres. But when you actually get a hold of both guys, I think Letts is harder to take down than Caceres. So if Pineda was able to get Letts down, he's also got a great chance of getting Caceres down. And if he does get Caceres down, Caceres is so weak off his back, I think he's going to be in a lot of trouble. So this is a very hard call, a uh, hard fight for me to call um, because I think. No matter who you put your money on in this one, you are putting your money in a lot of danger. It's very dangerous to bet Caceres as a big favourite because you know if the fight goes to the ground, he's absolutely screwed. But it's kind of dangerous to put your money on Pineda as well because with him being almost 38 years old, his reflex is a shot. And you know if he can't get the fight to the ground, Caceres is going to light him up bad. Now, in terms of how I view this fight from a betting point of view... This is a fight which I think is pretty clearly dog or pass. I'm not going to bet it personally just because we know it is extremely rare that guys in their late 30s, particularly in the featherweight division, win, right? Father time's undefeated and, and you know, Pineda's going to be declining significantly from fight to fight. So I've just got like a hard rule to keep me out of trouble that I don't bet on old declining fighters. And for that reason, I can't bet Pineda. But if you're the type of guy that wants to sprinkle a little bit of money on every fight to watch every fight or to make watching every fight more interesting, I do think Pineda is your guy here. For me, it would be lunacy to bet on Caceres at reasonably big favourite odds knowing how outgunned he is on the ground and, and how dangerous Pineda is on the ground. But, you know, if you look at Pineda's odds, 2.40 plus 140 for an implied probability of 42%. I don't think you're getting a particularly good deal on Pineda. I don't think there's any value there. because He's 38 years old and, and we know he's going to get you know lit up bad if the fight stays standing. So this is definitely dog or pass for me, but it's not a fight I'll be betting personally. I would give uh, give this one a miss. Now, obviously, we don't have the odds on the prop bets, uh, which is super annoying. But we can do the over-under. So, fight goes to a decision, odds are 3.0, fight does not go to a decision, 1.36. Um, it's not that likely the fight goes to a decision, simply because if you look at Pineda's record, the guy never goes to a decision. I mean, he hasn't been to a decision since 2016. So, Pineda is the kind of guy that has a kill or be killed style. Uh, very rarely goes to a decision hasn't been to a decision for seven years um will this fight break that trend will this one go to a decision maybe 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 you know we can see that caceres fights to a decision relatively frequently um but pineda like i say is likely to get outgunned on the feet pretty bad so if he stays standing he's likely going to get stopped 
if the fight goes to the ground, Caceres' submission defense is very bad. So he's likely going to get smashed with ground and pound and stopped. Or submitted and stopped. So either way, it's more likely the fight doesn't go to a decision. However, if you let the odds do the work for you, you have to be a crazy person to bet that in this odds range. Just very little, you know, very little upside in betting this at, at steep favorite odds. So again, if you're one of these people that want to sprinkle a little bit of money on every fight to make watching the fight more interesting, fight goes to a decision is going to give you a better risk to reward ratio. But it's not something I'll be betting myself. I don't particularly like it myself either. So I hope you found that useful. Now let's break down one of the most interesting fights on the card, which is going to be Jim Miller against Jared Gordon. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that my dog has just turned up. And if you can hear him, he's going to be wandering around in the background. But the odds are Jared Gordon's the favourite at average odds are around 1.55 which is going to be minus 182 for an implied probability of 65%. We take a look at the odds on his opponent, Jim Miller. He is around an average of 2.5, say 2.50, which is going to be plus 150 for an implied probability of 40%. So Gordon is 34 years old, 5 foot 9 with 68 inch reach. And Miller is 39 years old, 5 for 8 with a 71 inch reach. So both guys roughly the same size, not much of a size difference between the two. Both also in the tail end of their careers. Gordon is going to be 35 years old soon. Miller is going to be 40 years old soon. And we know Miller is on a steep decline. He has been over the last few years. No surprise with all the injuries he's had, all the health issues he's had. All the fights he's had. He's got a lot of miles on the clock. So we know Miller is going to be declining from fight to fight. There is no question of that. Um, but this is an interesting matchup. And one of the most difficult fights for betting that I've encountered in recent memory. Simply because this is one of those strange fights. Where I actually feel that Jim Miller is significantly better than Jared Gordon in every single aspect of MMA. Not just a little bit better, a lot better. Um, and yet, the odds don't reflect that because you can see that, obviously, Jared Gordon's a reasonably big favourite. So, that in itself just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Because if you've got a fighter that is significantly better than their opponent everywhere, you'd assume that they would be the favourite. So this is quite a complex matchup because when you look at how they match up skill for skill, there's literally nothing Gordon does better than Miller. But you guys know me. If you've watched my content for a long time, if you're a member of my community, if you're part of our Discord, you'll know that I have fixed rules in place that keep me out of trouble. And... I'll actually show you i'll actually show you something pretty crazy actually so as you guys know live betting mma is my speciality right it's i mean we perform insanely well at it we have barely ever had a losing quarter um we scroll down you can see just profitable quarter after profitable quarter we just consistently grind out profits but I don't perform well on pre-fight betting. It's a lot more difficult. But what you can see in the pre-fight results here is if we just ignore this bit to the left, and you'll understand in a moment why I want you to ignore this. If we just ignore this to the left, and we just focus on this little section here since July 2022, so in the last year, you can see in the last year, been on a nice steady uptrend right like if you just cut out that little section you can see a very nice steady uptrend on the chart and the reason why i've been able to make steady gains over you know the last year or so for that specific type of bet on the website you know there's lots of different types of bets on the website there's there's all different kinds of bets but for my uh, bets that i feel the most confident in Last year, I started to notice a little bit of a trend where there were certain types of bets that I would win at a really high percentage of the time. 
and then there were other kind of bets which were consistently costing me money and what actually happened as a result of that was I floated around break even for a long time see like we're kind of bouncing around break even here the reason being there would be some bets that I would be very profitable on and some bets I was not profitable on so the bets that I didn't perform well on would eat into the profits from the bets that I did perform well on and I noticed this trend and so where you see over the last sort of year profits just like slowly grinding up without really any major dips is because I identified that one of the types of bets that was consistently costing me money over the long term was where I bet on beat up old fighters against younger guys if I felt there was value there, right? This is a very, very complex topic. But what I found was over a, you know, a large sample size of bets was when I encountered matchups like this where I would find an older guy on a decline facing a younger guy that wasn't on a decline I would often find that the older guy on a decline would be at relatively decent odds against the younger guy. And so I would bet him for value. And what I found is these guys just consistently found ways to lose over a long period of time. And that these bets were costing me money. And as soon as I eliminated these bets, that's when you start to see like that over the last year, a nice steady uptrend. So this is one of those matchups where I've imposed like a hard and fast rule, like a rigid rule, a strict rule to stop me from uh, placing bets that cost me money long term. And for that reason, I can't touch Jim Miller. A year ago, I would have bet Jim Miller. A year ago, I would have been all over Jim Miller. But I know that even if Jim Miller wins this weekend, passing is the correct thing to do because I know bets like this are not profitable for me long term so when i break this fight down from a stylistic point of view i don't have many good things to say about jared gordon i think he's in a lot of trouble in this fight but at the end of the day the numbers don't lie and the data shows guys like jim miller just find ways to lose against guys like jared gordon more often than not so no matter what the fight research shows the fight footage shows the smartest thing to do is probably just to pass and not put your money in harm's way but we are going to break this down stylistically so you can kind of understand why gordon is in a lot of trouble in this fight so if we start off when it comes to probably the easiest area of this fight to break down the grappling jared gordon's takedown offense is all right his ground game's not bad however he is nowhere near the level of jim miller on the ground Miller's got decent offensive wrestling, a heavy top game, world-class Brazilian jiu-jitsu, excellent back control, and he's just mean and nasty and very effective on the ground. If you go back and watch Jared Gordon's fight on the ground against Grant Dawson, he got absolutely dominated by Grant Dawson on the ground. Just dominated. There were levels and levels and levels and levels between him and Dawson. In terms of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Miller is just as good as Dawson, if not better. At this stage in his career, he may not have the physicality, the athleticism of Dawson, but he certainly has the technique. And so when I look at the Gordon-Dawson fight and how easily Dawson was able to get Gordon down, take his back and control him for long periods from back control, there's no reason why Jim Miller can't do that to him. And so straight away if this fight goes to the ground jim miller should have a huge advantage now when it comes to striking i think miller's got an advantage there we know that gordon's biggest weakness throughout his career has been that he's a little bit chinny we've seen him get rocked dropped wobbled knocked out so many times in his career he is also coming back after being brutally knocked out in his last fight you know literally a month ago we know it can take the brain a long time to heal from knockouts sometimes the brain never fully heals from a knockout and so you know having been brutally knocked out just a month ago 
you know, will it make him even more susceptible to, be, to being knocked out in this fight? We know Miller's a dangerous southpaw with power in his hands and good boxing. He's got really nasty leg kicks. And Gorton does like to get into big exchanges. And the thing is, even though Miller's 40 years old, he's still t- tough as nails. He's still an absolute dog. And if you look at his record, his chin is still pretty fucking good. He hasn't been knocked out since 2018. So he hasn't been knocked out in five years. And that's pretty fucking impressive when you look at the names of the guys that he's been fighting. You know, going the distance with a young hungry bull like Alexander Hernandez. We all know how hard Hernandez hits. You know, even guys like Nicolas Mata, a young, aggressive, athletic Brazilian with power in his hands. And so this is a very, very dangerous fight for Jared Gordon because... I think Miller is a dangerous striker, a, a more dangerous striker, a better striker, significantly better grappler than Jared Gordon. Now, the one, the one obvious um, opportunity for Jared Gordon in this fight is his youthfulness, right? I mean, I know he's no spring chicken. He's almost 35 years old. But Gordon is getting better, right? He, he certainly hasn't shown any signs of decline yet. Whereas Miller is declining from fight to fight. He slows down as fights wear on. He's a lot flatter than he used to be. He doesn't have the same physicality as he used to have. And, you know, at his age, he's going to be getting worse and worse from fight to fight. So, like I said, you know, um, guys in Jim Miller's position find ways to lose very often. And for that reason, it's hard for me to bet Jim Miller. But if you look at this fight skill for skill, ugh. He could absolutely dominate this one. And it is a tough fight for Jared Gordon. Um, it's a tricky one. It, it, I'm very interested to see how this plays out. It took all my discipline, all my strength not to bet Jim Miller this week. I really, really want to bet him. Stylistically, I think it's a great fight for him. But at the end of the day, you know, what is the point in doing data analysis if you don't... Uh, if you don't... If you don't act upon... The information and the trends that you discover. I mean, what's the what's the point in doing it in the first place? So I know betting on guys like Jim Miller in fights like this are not profitable for me long term. Therefore, I will not bet Jim Miller. But fuck me, this is a good stylistic matchup for him. And I, I think he's likely to do really well. So if we look at the over-under on this one, we can't look at the props because, well, they're not on best fight odds. But if we look at the over-under... Uh, fight goes to a decision 1.67 fight doesn't go to a decision 2.15 I do think it is more likely to go to a decision both guys are pretty tough if you look at Gorton's record he's a bit of a decisionator um, you know we take that one out of the equations it ended in weird circumstances five out of his last six have gone to a decision you look at Miller um you know, he also quite frequently goes to a decision as well. I do think it's more likely this fight goes to a decision, but I wouldn't bet it because Miller is old, is fragile, he's beat up. Probably not going to take too much to get him out of there at this stage in his career. And on the flip side, Gordon tends to get rocked, wobbled, dropped a lot in fights, and his submission defense isn't amazing either. So I could see Miller getting a finish here. So I would personally avoid this. I would not bet it. Uh, in terms of the money line, there's it's dog or pass for me there's no question if you really 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 want to bet this fight you have to bet Jim Miller you'd have to be out of your fucking mind to bet Jared Gordon knowing Miller's better than him everywhere it just doesn't make sense to me so I hope you found that useful hope you found that useful and uh hope you found that useful Let me just check a couple things Alrighty then, alrighty then, alrighty then. Okay, so now let's break down the next fight on this card, which is going to be Tim Elliott against Victor Altamirano. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Elliott is the favourite at average odds of around 1.57, which is going to be minus 175 for an implied probability of 64%. If we take a look at the odds on Victor Altamirano, he's around an average of 2.45, which is going to be plus 145 for an implied probability of 41%. So 
So Elliot is 36 years old, 5 foot 7 with a 67 inch reach. And Alta Morano is 32 years old, 5 foot 8 with a 70 and a half inch reach. So we can see Elliot is very old for a flyweight. We know that the lighter weight classes decline earlier just because the lighter weight classes rely a lot more on speed reflexes and athleticism than the heavier weight classes. Um, and we can also see that both guys are roughly about the same size. Altamirano a little bit longer, a little bit taller, but nothing major. So this is one of those fights where... where I don't even know where to begin with this one. It's always kind of chaotic when you're breaking down a Tim Elliott fight. There is one more X factor that we've got to talk about. Um, I don't want to bring up any like links or you know uh, like media articles or anything to show this. Don't really want to draw much more attention to it. But uh, Tim Elliott has obviously been going through a really tough time, you know, in, in recent months because his wife Gina Mazzani cheated on him with his friend and training partner Kevin Croom. On top of that, Tim Elliott was also close friends with James Krause, who was his head trainer. Um, and so, we all know what has happened to James Krause with... I mean, how do I even sum up what the fuck's happened to James Krause? Anyway, Krause is in a lot of trouble, and he's not Elliott's head trainer anymore. So, in recent months, Tim Elliott has lost his... One of his good friends in Kevin Croom, who I believe was the best man at his wedding. So he's lost one of his best friends. He's lost his wife, Gina Mazzani. And he's also lost his head coach, James Krause. So to say that Elliot is facing some challenges coming into this fight is an understatement. Now, on one hand, this could all light a fire under him and motivate him. And this is certainly... A very winnable fight for him against Alta Morano. But at the same time, all those distractions, all that pressure, all that stress could have also had a negative impact on Tim's ability to train properly for this fight. And there have been situations in the past where he has slowed in, you know, in, in some of his past fights. So it's an interesting matchup because Alta Morano is a very meat and potatoes fighter. I don't want to be disrespectful to Alta Morano, but there is absolutely nothing special about him that would phase Tim Elliott in any way. Alta Morano is, is, is a very, like, generic fighter. It, you know, he's not particularly athletic. He doesn't really have power in his hands. He doesn't have particularly good striking technique. He doesn't really have any grappling um he's just a serviceable fighter that is reasonably good everywhere reasonably good mma grappler reasonably good boxer you know decent gas tank pretty tough fights at a good pace but tim elliott has been in there with the best flyweights in the world there's pretty much no one that elliott hasn't fought He's faced the who's who in the flyweight division. Davison Figueredo, Demetrius Johnson, you know, Joseph Benavides, Ali Bagatinov, John Dodson, Jens Pulver, Askar Askarov, Brandon Royval, Ryan Benoit. Impressive list of opponents, right? And he almost actually beat Demetrius Johnson. That's the story for another day. But anyway, point being... Elliot has faced the best flyweights in the world. And when I look at Alta Morano, there's nothing that Alta Morano does particularly well that could cause Elliot a problem. It's unlikely Alta Morano is going to cause Elliot a problem on the ground. We know Elliot is primarily a grappler. It's unlikely Alta Morano is going to cause him too many problems on the feet. Even though Elliot has got bad striking defense, Alta Morano is a very meat and potatoes boxer without a whole lot of power in his hands. Altamirano has a lot more to worry about with Tim Elliott because Elliott, you know, is a tricky MMA grappler with a very unorthodox style, dangerous submission game. He's also awkward and difficult to read on the feet. He's got that like that goofy, weird style. So this is one of those matchups where 
Elliot is probably going to be too experienced for Alta Morano in this one. And we'll probably find a way to win. Alta Morano. Elliot. Elliot does have a habit of making life hard for himself. I've gone blurry again. Fuck's sake. Let's move that over. Um, let's pop that back. See if that's better. Uh, Elliot does have a habit of making life hard for himself. He does have bad fight IQ. Um, Altamirano is reasonably skilled enough, well-rounded enough to keep this one competitive. But this is one of those fights where I just think Elliot will more than likely find a way to win, just because he's he's faced guys like Al, you know, ten times better than Altamirano and and been very competitive against them. Um, I just think this is one of those fights where Altamirano is not really dangerous to cause Elliot too many problems on the feet and he's not going to be able to outgrapple him. But I wouldn't be surprised if this one does turn out to be pretty close simply because Altamirano has got a decent gas tank. He's game as hell. He will go hard for three rounds. Elliot has been known to slow down in the past. He is getting older. and Obviously, he's dealing with a lot of issues outside the octagon at the moment with his personal life, which could have a detrimental impact on his performance. But Elliot should get this done. From a betting point of view, very difficult fight to bet. There's no way that I would bet Elliot in this odds range. He's very inconsistent. He's just not the kind of guy that I would want to be betting as a big favourite. At the same time, not interested in betting Altamirano as an underdog either. Because, well, I don't really think he has a clear and obvious path to victory over, to, over Elliot. I can't describe to you how Altamirano is going to win this matchup. Outside of Elliot underperforming, making mistakes, um, you know, and, and just not performing particularly well, which is always reasonably likely with a guy like Elliot, but obviously a pretty tricky thing to bet on because we know if both guys show up and perform to their full potential, Altamirano is probably going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, but hopefully, Elliot gets a bit of a break from the universe this weekend and gets a win because, um, you know, you got to worry for guys like Tim Mann. I do feel bad for him. It sounds like he's going through a real tough time at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it would be nice to see Tim get a win this weekend. So, in terms of the over-under on this one, very, very likely the fight goes to a decision. If we look at Elliot's record, uh, he's very much a decisionator, has been for most of his career. His last four fights have gone to a decision. If you look at Alta Morano, he's a bit of a decisionator as well. Four of his last five have gone to a decision. Very, 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 very likely this goes to a decision. The odds are pretty steep. So that bet doesn't interest me at 1.40 minus 250. But I would be surprised if this one ended inside the distance. Um, yeah, this one's probably going to go to a decision. And again, we can't break down the props. Because they're not fucking on best fight odds yet, which is a bit annoying. So I hope you found that useful. Now let's break down the next fight on this card, which is going to be Kareen Silver versus Catelyn Souser. So we can see that Kareen Silver is a pretty big favourite at average odds of about 1.44, which is minus 227 for an implied probability of 69%. If we take a look at the odds on Catelyn Souser, she is around an average of 2.80, which is going to be plus 180 for an implied probability of 36%. So Kareen Silva is 29 years old, 5 foot 5 with a 67 inch reach, and Catelyn Souser, 27 years old, 5 foot 3. We don't know what her reach is. This is also going to be Souser's UFC debut and a pretty big step having competition for her as well, in my opinion. Um so this is one of those fights where I kind of understand the odds, but at the same time, um, you'd have to be a crazy person to bet on silver at these odds just because we don't know a whole lot about her striking. And she's one of these really frustrating fighters that if you take her down and put her on her back, she makes no effort to get back up to her feet at all. She just lays there hunting for long shot submissions off her back. Um, having said that, I do understand why Silva's the favourite in this one. Because when I watched footage of Souza, she is not particularly good. 
So she probably has a slight edge on the feet over Kareen Silva in this fight. But Souza has pretty bad takedown defense and a pretty low level ground game. Which is a bit of an issue against Kareen Silva, who's got decent offensive wrestling, a decent submission game, and a heavy top game as well. So Silva's one of these very weird MMA grapplers that is very good at being the hammer, but not so good at being the nail. In terms of if she takes you down and gets into a dominant position, you know, if she's controlling the grappling exchanges, she's very good. But if you put her on her back, if you force her to react to what you're doing, if you obtain a dominant position on her, she's very, very bad. However, because Souza is also very bad, and because Silva is the better MMA grappler, it's more likely Silva will be able to take Souza down and obtain a dominant position on her before Souza is able to take Silva down and obtain a dominant position. So, obviously, because of that, my lean is Silva in this fight. But the odds are not interesting to me at all. Because, like I say, she's very, very weak off her back. Um, so this is one of those fights where I don't really have an interest in betting it. Because I think Silver will win. But I think her advantages are definitely baked into her odds. And there is no value there whatsoever. If you really, really, really want to bet this fight to make watching it more interesting... There is no doubt that it is a dog or pass fight. You've got to take Souza or pass. But just know Souza is not very good. And I could certainly see Silva just taking Souza down and absolutely dominating her. On the flip side, I could see Souza getting on top of Silva and racking up a lot of top control. Or Souza keeping the fight standing and, and chipping away at Silva and outstriking her on the feet. But the most likely outcome is Silva using her grappling to win this. But this is not a fight that I would bet if I were you. Um, not the best week for betting. You've got to be smart with your money. We've performed really well lately. We've been crushing live betting. We've been doing great in pre-fight betting at all. Just got to be smart. Protect the profits. Because we know solid bets, better events. Just around the corner. Just around the corner. Here is a mess. We only got one fight left. So it's all good. All right. So in terms of the over under on this one, very difficult to lean either way because we don't we don't know a lot about either girl facing UFC level opponents. Because if you look at Silver's record, majority of her recent fights have ended inside the distance. Majority of Souza's recent fights have gone to a decision. I'm finding it very difficult to get a lean on the over-under on this one simply because neither girl is particularly dangerous on the feet. So if the fight stays standing, it's not that likely we get a finish. But we don't really know what Catelyn Souza's submission defense is like because we haven't really seen her face uh, any particularly good grapplers. So for all we know, Silva could just take Souza down and strangle her to death. Um... Or Souza's submission defense could be pretty good and she could defend herself well on the ground and Silva kind of just holds her down and lay and prays her way to a boring decision win. It's difficult to say either way. So I don't have a strong opinion on the fight to go to a decision or not. So I'm going to give that one a little bit of a pass. I just don't know, unfortunately. I don't have a strong feeling on it. Um, I think both Souza and Silva are a little bit of an unknown for me. Still got a lot to learn about both girls with them being new to the UFC. So let's get into the final fight on this main card now, which is going to be Jamie Malaki against Mahamajan Naimov. So Malaki is a pretty big favourite at average odds of about 1.23, which is going to be minus 435 for an implied probability of 81 percent if we take a look at the odds on naimov he is about an average of 4.25 which is going to be plus 325 for an implied probability of 24 percent so malarkey 28 years old six foot tall with a 74 inch reach and naimov 28 years old five foot nine with a 70 inch reach so both guys the same age you can see jamie malarkey longer and taller 
bit taller than Naimov, has a four-inch reach advantage as well. As you can see from this picture, Naimov has got that small, muscular, compact body type. Malaki is a little bit longer, leaner, and taller. And um, obviously the other X factor to consider in this one is that Naimov is stepping up to take this fight on about four, four or five days' notice. Malaki was originally scheduled to face Guram Kutataladze, and Kutataladze pulled out earlier this week due to visa issues. So Naimov coming in on very short notice, which is a big part of the reason why he is a big underdog in this fight, because obviously it is very rare to see fighters come in on less than a week's notice and perform well. They haven't had time to cut weight properly, they haven't done a training camp, very difficult circumstances to make the UFC debut under. And this is a good stylistic matchup for Jamie Malarkey, to be fair. Neymar just isn't very good. Um, his takedown offense is bad. He's not particularly good on the ground. He tends to slow his fights wear on. Very much a basic single shot striker. Malarkey is probably better everywhere. He's probably the better MMA grappler. He's got better footwork, better movement, faster. So he's a higher volume of strikes. A, a, a higher diversity of strikes as well. Um, there's a big skill gap between these two and you know even if Matt Naimov were coming in on a full camp here I'd expect Malaki to do very well the fact that Naimov is coming in on just a few days notice makes this even easier for Malaki so he deserves to be a big favorite I think he's going to win this fight very very easily in my opinion so yeah it, it's, it's tricky obviously you can't bet Malaki at these odds He's a big favourite. Very little upside in taking Malaki. But, you know, very, very... I feel that betting guys coming on in less than a week's notice, no matter how big underdogs they are, it's going to be a difficult path to profitability long term since so few fighters win when they make the debut under those circumstances. So, yeah, that's pretty much it for that fight. I don't have any props for it because the fight was only made yesterday, I believe. So I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you make lots of money. I hope you also come check out my website, mmabettingtips.com. Link in the description below. If you like these breakdown videos, you want more of them for all the prelim fights on this card, you can get them on my website. Just go to betting tips, pre-fight betting tips, and there you can find breakdown videos for every single matchup on this card. So you don't have to go through the pain of doing the fight research yourself. I'll do it for you. You can use these videos as kind of a strategy guide to plan your own bets, make your life a lot easier, and hopefully enable you to earn some extra cash uh, from the information that I kind of summarized from the fight footage in really short videos such as this. So thanks everyone for watching. Take care. Love you all. And I'll see you in next week's video. Nice one, guys.